Welcome to my channel. Please click like, share, and subscribe. This is Motown Chronicles, Part 6, Diana Ross. 1966 ended with the Supremes recording a double album of Rodgers and Hart standards. After a guest appearance on, the, on an ABC television special saluting their music, the girls and Gil Askey went into Detroit studios to record the new collection. It turned out to be some of their finest, most revealing work. On tunes like, With a Song in My Heart, It Never Entered My Mind, and The Lady is a Tramp, Diana proved herself to be a vocalist who was much more stylistically mature than even Barry had imagined. Mary and Florence were also coming into their own with this work, and it seemed that, as a group, the Supremes were never more cohesive. Amazing, considering all the turmoil behind the scenes. The new year began with the group in the recording studio again, this time cutting sides for an odd collection of songs associated with Walt Disney films. The album The Supreme Sing and Perform Disney Classics will be completed but never released. Their latest single, Love Is Here and Now You're Gone, was number one in the country and the group had recently performed it on Andy Williams' NBC series. The Supremes were scheduled for an appearance at the Elmwood Casino in Ontario, Canada at the end of January and then off to a few more dates in the area before returning home to the Rooster Tail in Detroit. One of the biggest problems between Florence and Barry was that whenever they would have a disagreement which was happening more frequently as weeks passed, she would inevitably threaten him by implying that she knew information about his business that could prove to be somehow damaging. By now, he must have known that Florence's threats were empty. Perhaps she did have information that could prove to be harmful to his empire, but she really wasn't shrewd enough to know what to do with it. And who would believe her anyway if she simply went to the media? Whatever she thought she knew would just be more fodder for gossip mills. And Barry was so accustomed to gossip about Motown and its alleged underworld ties that it no longer bothered him. Certainly now, Barry was probably bored with Florence Ballard and with her ambiguous threats. And if I can't control her, I don't want her around she remembered him as having said. There was more at stake here than just strife within the Supremes and bitter animosity between Barry and Florence. Barry had to look at the bigger picture. Florence Ballard was dangerous, not because of anything she thought she knew, but because she was making Barry look weak. Word had begun to filter down to the other artists that she was a troublemaker, that she pushed Gordy to the limit, calling him and his girlfriend names and actually got away with it. He had to show that she was expendable and if she was one of the high and mighty Supremes then so was everyone else at the company who might challenge him and his authority. His task would be easier if the other two girls just insisted she be ousted. Often Barry would try to put them against one another for instance, once when they were exhausted by a series of recording dates and concerts, he had a meeting with them and said, I was going to give you girls 10 days off, but I decided not to do that. When they protested, he explained, you could have had the time off, but Florence thinks too much. Then he walked out of the room, leaving the three of them to argue over an issue they couldn't even pinpoint. Barry had been in business long enough to know that often an enemy will come along whose cunning and even common sense are impaired by some kind of weakness. When he found these kinds of weak opponents, he knew they would always do themselves in eventually. Perhaps Barry believed that if he waited long enough, Florence would probably destroy herself because she was weak, unhappy, and had a need for alcohol. But he didn't have time to wait. The Supremes were more marketable and profitable than ever. 
Diana's star continued to ascend and Barry believed in capturing the moment. At the end of March, Barry posed the question to Diana, what do you think we should do about Florence? She's got to go, Barry. She's ruining everything. Barry was glad to say that. They were in agreement. Later in the week, he called Diana and Mary to a meeting at his home in Detroit. I think we have to replace Florence, Barry said to the two girls. He was trying to make this matter appear to be a group decision, even though his mind was already made up. Bringing Mary into the discussion was a formality, a courtesy. But then Barry found that he had an unexpected ally when Mary actually agreed that Florence had to go. Years later, Mary would always take Florence's side in every disagreement that pitted her against Barry and Diana. But the truth is that Mary was aligned with the enemy in the decision to get rid of the troublemaker. Not only did she fail to tell Florence about the meeting, she also kept secret the fact that she, Diana, and Barry had conspired to find a quick replacement. Florence once said of her relationship with Diana and Mary, I would rather deal with Diane than I would with Mary, because Diane is honest even though she's mean. At least you know how she feels and you can deal with it. But Mary, she can say one thing and do another. She's not always honest with you. Mary had been the most marvelous person in the world, Diana said in an interview. When we had problems, I didn't even, even have to worry about Mary because she was always there with me. I started off making decisions for the group out of necessity because Mary was the type of person who wasn't the decision-making sort. She wasn't the kind of person who would say, I think we should do so-and-so. Whatever the majority decided, she would go along with it. At this time, Mary and I sat down and had a talk, Diana continued. We decided that if Florence leaves the group, we'd either try to find another girl to sing with us, and maybe the public wouldn't accept her, or, Mary said, maybe I'd get married. Then I said, I had no real ideas about getting married, so I thought maybe if this did come about, perhaps I'd go out as single. While she mulled over the possibilities of single stardom, Diana suggest suggested that Cindy Birdsong, a member of Patti LaBelle and the Bluebells, a popular rhythm and blues group originating out of New Jersey, be considered as a temporary replacement for Florence and the Supremes. Gordy had one of his aides, Larry Maxwell, find her. Diana had liked Cindy ever since she first met her when the Supreme shared a bill with the Bluebells at the Uptown Theater in Philadelphia. In those days, days there was a lot of rivalry among girl singing groups, Birdsong recalled, so it wasn't a good idea to socialize with the competition. Our girls, the Bluebells, definitely hated the Supremes because they seemed like they were stuck up. So classy and all. We also had feuds with the Shirelles, but that's the way it was back then. I sort of liked the Supremes though. They seemed different, as if they really had nice personalities under all of the sequins and glitter. So one night between shows, I decided to sneak over to their dressing room and meet them. I wanted to know what made them click. I loved the way the girls did their makeup. We bluebells hardly wore any at all, just a little eye pencil and lipstick because our manager insisted that we don't wear makeup. When I knocked on their dressing room door, Diana opened up and immediately welcomed me in. Mary and Florence were quite aloof, and I suppose it's because they thought I was spying on them. But Diane, she was open and warm, so I asked her for makeup tips. Diana pushed Cindy down in a chair and eagerly began to divulge her makeup secrets. She opened her cosmetic kit and proudly lifted out a tray of false eyelashes, dozens of them, each pair in its own special case. After choosing just the right ones, she carefully applied the heavy lashes and thick liner to Cindy's eyes. 
Cindy stared unbelievingly at her ma magically changing image in the dressing room mirror. Heavy lipstick and blush were added as finishing touches. Well, just look at you, Miss Cindy Birdsong, Diana said happily. Just look at how glamorous you are. Do you like it? Do I like it? I love it, Cindy enthused. But my girls, they are going to hate it. Oh, no, they won't, Diana insisted. How could they? Here, put this on. Diana reached over to a white styrofoam mannequin head and handed Cindy a fluffy wig. Try this. I know this will make all the difference. Oh, no, I couldn't possibly, Cindy hesitated. She looked around to find Mary and Florence and realized that both girls were standing in a corner looking disapprovingly with their arms folded over their chests. Sure you can, Diana urged, ignoring her singing partners. Before she realized it, Diana had pulled Cindy's hair back and began to secure a net around it. Then she put the wig on and started brushing the curls into place. Suddenly, Cindy looked like one of the Supremes. In fact, she looked almost like Florence, which probably didn't sit well with Flo. Now you go over there to your girls and you tell them that if they need any help at all, they should come over here and see me and my girls, Diana said proudly. Cindy thanked her profusely and left. You know what, Florence offered? That girl is going to be dead in about two minutes. <laughs> Sorry, y'all. That's funny. Birdsong walked down the hall into her dressing room. And as soon as Patty LaBelle saw her, she nearly fainted. What have you done to yourself? She asked suspiciously. When Cindy explained Diana's handiwork, her singing partners were not at all happy with the transformation. Well, I think you look ridiculous, Nona Hendricks said as she grabbed the wig from Cindy's head. And you can tell Miss Diana Ross what to do with her fake white girl's hair. The door opened. As the three Supremes stood watching in the doorway of their dressing room, a wig came sailing down the hallway. Diana caught it in mid -air. The girls couldn't help but laugh. Now it seemed that Diana Ross had more plans for Cindy Birdsong, and this time Gordy was involved. Larry Maxwell located Birdsong's mother, Annie, and telephoned her in Camden, hoping to track down her daughter. When he finally found Cindy and explained why he was calling, she promptly hung up on him, thinking the call was a prank. When he called back, Birdsong agreed to see him. Maxwell was on the next plane to Camden and spent hours with Cindy explaining the situation. When I got the whole story, I wasn't sure I wanted to do it, she said. She went back to Detroit with Maxwell to meet with Gordy Ross and Wilson. As far as everyone was concerned, Cindy was in. Now it was just a matter of getting Florence out. 